Hello, and thank you for joining us for the SLW Institute webinar, Clean Tech, Follow the Money and the Patents. A recording of the webinar and the slides will be made available to all registrants. Feel free to enter any questions using the Q&A feature or the chat in the Zoom menu. We invite you to follow us on LinkedIn to see news about other upcoming webinars. And with that, I'll turn things over to our moderator. Thanks, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Good morning to you or good afternoon, depending on where you are. I believe we even have some listeners in the UK. Good evening to you if you're there. Uh, this is Piers Blewett speaking, the uh, funny sounding person appearing on the left of your screen at the moment. Um, well, welcome to our inaugural webinar in our Emerging Tech series. Today, we we're going to be talking about clean tech. Um, and I'm very pleased to have with me on the, on the panel some very um, highly informed speakers and, and experienced uh, analysts. Um, first of all, uh, Ben Hall, a sort of competitive intelligence guru and business analyst who'll be speaking about where the money is going and who's providing it and who's getting it and what they're doing with it in this area. Um, Rob Stans, our analytics specialist, will then give an overview of where the patents are going and what IP is being pursued. And then finally, if time permits, Andre will speak on sort of patent comments, uh, commons and uh, licensing areas. So uh, feel free to pose questions along the way. We're very happy to take them as we go. Um, or, you know, as you know, we may get to a session at the end. So um, completely discussion, open discussion session. And uh, with that, let me hand it over to Ben. So next slide, please. And Ben, over to you. Great, thanks, Piers. Um, we can advance the next slide as well. Um, so I'm gonna dive right in. Um, when we talk about clean tech, um, we're often talking about green tech, sometimes uh, climate tech. Um, in some ways, clean tech has emerged as an umbrella term uh, encompassing the investment asset class, technology and business sectors. Um, clean tech was popularized around 2002 as a term to describe the green, uh, sorry, the green and clean uh, technologies that were sort of growing at the time. So solar, biofuels, um, even fuel cells, uh, renewable power generation, et cetera. Um, after the 2008 financial crisis, uh, climate tech was popularized as the new green tech investment term. Um, so often when you're doing searches uh, or if you're seeing uh, titles in Forbes or wherever, um, you'll often see climate tech uh, portrayed. Um, this was really an attempt to uh, regain investors' trust in the sector uh, after that collapse. Um, so today, climate tech is often the preferred term to describe investments in energy transitions, uh, biodiversity, um, and sustainability initiatives. So uh, to date, these climate tech verticals that you see on the screen here have been the major recipients of, of climate tech investment. I'm going to talk a little bit about those. Advanced slide. Um, so investments in climate tech startups are soaring. Um, this is really kind of heavy talk uh, at the start of the year. Um, in a recent World Economic Forum panel, actually, I think it was uh, last week, uh, John Kerry touted $40 billion uh, in private investment in 2021 uh, went towards clean tech. Um, according to Holon IQ's year-end report, um, the global VC investments were actually $37 billion for 2021. Um, taken together, uh, at least $221 billion were invested worldwide between 2013 and 2021. Um, and an amount roughly totaling 90 billion was invested solely between 2020 and 2021. Um, also numbers that I saw today from Bloomberg maintain that uh, energy transition and climate tech uh, attracted more than 900 billion last year. So um, however you define that market, so if you call it the total market for energy transition um, in which subsectors you add or respective challenge areas, um, a lot of money is flooding um, into climate tech. Um, the average size of a climate tech deal almost quadrupled um, to 96 million in the first half of 2021. Um, this was up from around 27 million um, just one year prior, according to PwC. Um, climate tech investments have also surged nearly five times since the Paris Agreement. I thought this was interesting. 
Um, one thing we also know is that uh, mobility and transport has attracted the most investors. You can advance slide. So mobility and transport has accounted for uh, more than 60% of all climate tech VC investments um, from that 2013 period to mid 2021, um, according to really the kind of high, highly cited um, biggest report out there by PwC. Um, as you can see though, uh, the biggest emitters are, are not attracting the most funding. Um, I think that a big reason for this is the complexity of, of retooling uh, a lot of the manufacturing um, that's necessary to make these changes. Also dismantling whole systems of the built environment um, is also required. Um, we know now that current infrastructure needs to be modernized to even have a chance at lowering our emissions. Um, so also in the number two investment spot here is energy. Um, this includes energy storage um, and grid management, uh, which has seen investments uh, nearly double um, in just the last two years. So uh, just brief overview of this slide. Uh, transport leads um, far and away, but energy uh, and food and agriculture follow close behind and they're growing very quickly. Change slide. So for now, um, not really a surprise to anyone, the U.S. has a, a clear leadership position in climate tech. Um, at the moment, uh, the U.S. is attracting nearly nine, oh, sorry, 65% of VC investment. Um, climate tech investment in Europe, though, has grown nearly seven times um, in, the, in the last five years. So that's more than the global average of roughly 4.9 to 5% uh, growth. Um, according to deal room data, uh, American climate tech startups um, have been more successful not only in drawing more VC, but also at scaling. Um, and again, no surprise to anyone, uh, most of the uh, climate tech unicorns uh, currently operate out of greater Los Angeles, greater Boston, New York, and the Bay Area. Change slide. Um, according to PwC, in the first half of 2021, <clears throat> the number of active climate tech investors rose uh, from less than 900 in uh, the earlier part of, oh, sorry, the later part of 2019, early 2020, uh, to just over 1,600. And a lot of these numbers are uh, sort of disputed. Um, you'll see numbers as high as, as 3,000 investors, um, but PwC has actually identified over 6,000 unique investors uh, from VCs, private equity, corporate VCs, angel investors, government funds, and so on. Um, but together, that whole group uh, funded more than 3,000 climate tech startups um, between, between 2013 and again, that first half of 2021. So with climate technology, um, we've seen uh, roughly 210% increase in investments over the last two years. Um, interesting fact, uh, it's estimated that 14 cents of every VC dollar uh, now goes to climate tech. So that's substantial. Um, climate tech's uh, special purpose acquisition companies, uh, often you just refer to as SPACs, are also growing, um, accounting for more than a third uh, of all the climate tech funding um, between mid-2020 and mid-2021. So uh, where's the money going? Change slide. One of the more active funds in the space um, is Breakthrough Energy Ventures. Um, according to the SOSV Climate Summit, um, which was uh, heavily attended this past year, um, uh, they essentially, the SOSV uh, fund has designed um, this summit specifically for uh, climate tech startups uh, within the ecosystem. Um, and innovators to watch, according to them, include uh, Redwood Materials and Energy Storage. Um, they also list Form Energy, Heliogen, and Energy Vault, which will show up in the following slides. Um, they also uh, cite as innovators uh, Pivot Bio and Food and Ag Tech, which is depicted here. Um, also Upside Foods and Chiak Meats. Um, and finally, uh, Boston Metal for decarbonizing steel in the built environment. And those will show up as well. Change slide. So another VC firm that's investing heavily in climate tech as Energy Impact Partners. Um, and this is kind of a, a look at where their money is headed, uh, obviously filtered by amounts. Um, 
That one company I mentioned, Form Energy, is listed here, as well as Ecobee. Uh, advanced slide. Um, finally, uh, I wanted to show S2G Ventures investments. Um, I had mentioned a bit that ag tech and uh, food is, is getting kind of a, a big push um, just in the last year. Um, and so uh, S2G Ventures is a firm that invests heavily in ag tech. Um, and one 22, uh, sorry, 2022 trend that S2G notes on their website um, is RNA technology for agricultural pest control. Um, so they're actually creating uh, targeted RNA-based pesticides. They believe these to be the kind of the next frontier in biopesticides. Um, sometimes this is referred to as GMO 2.0, um, but it's a, it's a technique that um, gets at the heart of the plant. Um, obviously, we've all heard of RNA because of the vaccine, um, but the same technology is also being used to genetically modify um, a number of plants. Um, to actually sort of save them from pests. Um, the most well-known uh, being Impossible Burger is one of those um, uh, foods that was uh, that is part of that GMO 2.0 technique. Uh, now, some believe that synthetic biology will actually reinvent nature. Um, one company that's doing that is, is Ripple Foods. Um, down here at the bottom, you can see they got uh, 50, 65 million from S2G Ventures. Um, so it's super interesting stuff, what's happening um, in synthetic biology. Change slide. The SOSV uh, Climate Tech 100, um, not to be confused with the summit that they have, um, is actually part of their portfolio. Um, so SOSV is, is one of the, the larger uh, firms investing in climate tech. Um, they have a portfolio that spans more than a thousand companies. Um, what they've done on their website is they've broken it down to their top 100. Um, and you can see I have here, uh, their top 100 value grew by 44% in just five months. Um, so I've sorted here by uh, total funding according to Crunchbase. Um, I just wanna highlight a couple of the companies here. Um, one that I would note is R0, uh, which is an intelligent biosafety platform making UVC lights. They're based in San Francisco. Um, but their um, big proposition is disinfecting hospitals. Um, they've been at the top of a lot of lists for health and wellness company of the year, um, and they're, they're doing very, very well. So um, R0 is one I would watch. Um, the second company I'll briefly mention is Volt Storage. Um, Volt Storage develops and produces uh, solar energy storage systems uh, based on the eco-friendly redox flow technology. Um, and their revolutionary iron salt technology. Um, so essentially this technology allows uh, wind and solar farms to scale their grid load capacities, um, store energy for longer, um, and otherwise sort of distribute along grids a bit better. Change slide. Um, so based on my research, um, this is an uh, abbreviated watch list that, that I like. Um, I haven't talked about 75F or TWACE or Solidia, but um, these companies pop up a lot um, as you start to dig into climate technologies um, that are innovators in the space um, and that are, are growing. Um, so trying to move a little quicker now, but um, CB Insights um, maintains that uh, carbon capture is going to be perhaps one of the bigger trends happening this year. So if you can advance the slide. Uh, carbon capture can achieve um, roughly uh, estimates say about 14% of the global greenhouse gas emissions reductions needed by 2050. Um, it's viewed as perhaps the only practical way to achieve deep decarbonization in the industrial sector. Um, so I imagine we're actually gonna hear quite a bit more about carbon capture and utilization um, at the start of this year, um, really over the next, next quarter. Change slide. So I mentioned it earlier, but energy storage is also making a huge push. Um, so energy and ag tech um, are two of the areas that are experiencing a lot of growth. They have more to do to catch up with transport and mobility. Uh, however, they're well on their way. Um, so in terms of energy storage, um, I would I would see uh, there's well there's going to be a, a lot of companies uh, making big moves in this area. 
Um, based on my watch list from earlier, um, you can create your own watch list uh, with the SOSV Top 100. Um, one resource I like that I found is called the Diamond List. Uh, if you Google search Diamond List, uh, this is a great start for building your own watch list of next gen climate tech companies. Um, you know, obviously do a search in there for energy storage companies and you'll see a bunch there. And slide. Um, finally, uh, carbon credits um, have already been uh, kind of talked about extensively uh, over the last year. Um, the global carbon markets actually grew by over 20% in 2020 um, for the fourth consecutive year of, of exponential growth. Um, they're sold on uh, carbon markets that are also expected to break more records this year. Um, and I, I could spend a lot more time talking about carbon markets, but um, I would say look for voluntary uh, carbon markets um, from uh, larger industrials to begin scaling um, throughout 2022. And that's it for me. Great, Ben. Well, thanks very much for that. And um, the next section of our talk is looking at IP activity in the areas um, Ben just outlined. So aspects, for example, um, I don't want to say U.S. versus China, but but if you know Ben mentioned U.S. being a sort of clear leader in the in the area at the moment, but um, we'll look at some of the pattern activity of the two countries, um, and in particular some of the entities that um, Ben mentioned under the SOSV uh, venture, if you will, um, and other aspects of interest um, uh, that I'm sure we've all seen, you know, in the in the in the daily press, kind of, you know, uh, agriculture, food. Um, Internet of Things and sensors and so forth, energy storage, uh, carbon capture. And as we'll see, some of these themes are pretty strong in the patenting activities. So, Rob, if you're ready, next slide, please. And uh, Rob, over to you to walk us through what you what you looked at. Yeah, thanks, Piers. Appreciate it. And thank you all for joining today. Um, as I started my research on the patent side of things, I quickly identified um, within the patent classification system, this YO2 uh, technologies or applications for mitigation or adaptation against climate change. And um, this kind of completely encapsulates the clean tech um, area in patenting. And it, from there, you can see on the screen here, um, it's broken down into eight subclasses, uh, adaptation to climate change, building, buildings, housing, house appliances, and end user applications, capture storage, sequestration or disposal of greenhouse gases, uh, information and communication technologies, energy generation, transmission or distribution, uh, P, production or processing of goods, manufacturing, uh, T, transportation, and then W, wastewater treatment or waste management. So really we're gonna go into depth from kind of the broadest scale here um, and then kind of narrow in on some key subclasses that we're interested in. And then, as Piers just mentioned, look at some analytics within the startup sector. Let's go next slide here. Yeah. Um, as I started my research, I, I also ran into this um, EPO publication, Patents in the Energy Transition, that was really helpful for me getting started. Um, if you have interest in EP specific patent filing, this would be a really good spot to. Uh, to go to. It's linked here on the actual webinar. And um, as you can see, it helped me confirm the areas of technology within patenting um, on a, actually a higher level, more specific level. I won't get into them, um, but you can see here, um, it narrows in um, for sake of time, we can go. I did on the bottom there, you'll see smart grids is not within the YO2 um, sector, but it is YO4S. And I have included it on a few different slides here today. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so what we're looking at here is um, a full geographic breakdown of the top countries filing within the YO2 classification system. So this is any, any kind of um, clean tech technology. Um, as Piers mentioned, uh, China um, 20 years ago was on, in the orange and five years, within the last five years is in the blue. China had a 
a really aggressive filings in the last 20 years. They've come down, um, but as you'll see that everybody else is also I mean, getting maybe a titch closer. United States has taken over Japan. And I think PCT filings have taken over Japan in the last five years. Um, but China really has an aggressive filing strategy. And we did find that about uh, 600,000 of those were utility models within the filed in the last 20 years. So about a third of their filings are utility models. Next slide, please. Here's a breakdown of the subclassifications as I spoke to um, and the found activity again within the last 20 years and within the last five years. Um, you'll see on the up, up top, uh, the energy generation transmission or distribution is a, is a heavy leader in areas. Um, then going down to production, manufacturing, and then transportation. Um, you will see found in the last five years the energy generation sector really has come back to the pack. Um, and so that's interesting to see kind of the production, manufacturing, transportation, and adaptation kind of uh, catch, catch the energy generation sector. I will note, um, I forgot to mention earlier, that these classifications are not um, one or the other. You, you can, if it's found um, to be relevant, there are a number of subclasses that can be in one, one patent. Uh, next slide, please. Here's a look at the uh, top applicants, again, in the last 20 years and the last five years. What we were trying to do is kind of see any kind of up and comers here um, and anything that dropped off. You'll see, you'll notice up top, the heavy hitters are the main filers and then that's not going to change. Um, but we do see that Nissan, Toshiba, Hitachi, and Intel fell out of the top 20, while uh, Amperex, Kia, Huey, and Gree Electric Appliances uh, gained some traction here in the last five years. Um, trying to... And then Toyota, which was a really, really a leader within the la last 20 years, um, succumbed to LG as the top filer within the wild two sector. That was interesting. Next slide, please. This goes back to the publication I mentioned from the EPO. Um, I found it interesting. It, it's really similar data to the last chart you saw, but it's specific to the EPO filings. And so I wanted to include it as just an example from um, the charting in the publication. But it also gives you kind of where the foundation of the companies are filing. So you'll see German companies, Japanese companies, Korean companies, and US companies. Surprising that no, no, none of them were Chinese. Next slide, please. All right, this is a um, concept landscape and it is um, provided by Acclaim IP. I wanna make sure we source that. Um, and it's a really cool graph. What we're showing you here is the last 20 years of filings from Toyota and um, really gives you some insight into uh, the keywords that they're using. Um, it's, it's an automated technology, so it's not something that we put any input into, but you can quickly see kind of their main filing areas. Um, I know Piers was maybe gonna to speak to these as well. Yeah, thanks Rob. They, they, I love these concept charts. You know, you can see bottom right, traditional internal combustion engine activity, if you will, um, but equally as large or perhaps larger, you know, secondary battery, uh, electrode stuff, you know, the, so I, I think of the Prius when I look at this, um, power generation as a whole on, on the left, and then fuel cells and hydrogen fuel cells, you know, at the bottom, uh, which can be contrasted with, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is for Ford. Mm -hmm. um, so you have, of course, electric vehicle activity, bottom right, uh, some battery activity at the bottom in orange. Um, internal combustion, perhaps still a little heavier. But interestingly, you'll see a little section, let's call it at uh, 2 o'clock or 2.30 vehicle charging station in the darker green. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I think that's going to be obviously a key uh, 
a key aspect to get right uh, for the ubiquitous use of, of electric vehicles. So it's just interesting to us that Toyota and Ford, while both active, strongly active in this area, sort of direct their IP focus at, at different areas. So um, that's all we were really trying to point out here. Um, but nevertheless, still germane to the activities that um, Ben was talking about in the, in the earlier section. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rob. Yep. We have one more here to look at. Just I was I was actually mostly interested in Samsung just to see where they were inclusive, and you can flip to that. Um, you'll see obviously very heavy on the battery side of things, and thought just thought it was interesting to see non -trans transport um, area here. Again, apologies for the some of these get very small, but uh, a little plug for a claim IP here on the site, these are actually interactive and you can kind of dig in and see the actual patents that they're referring to on each side. And it's a really nice tool. Next slide, please. Here we're um, looking at the top five subclasses, their um, patent filings worldwide over the last 20, 18 -ish years, I guess, because we, um, you'll know at the end there in 2020, Due to the lag, lag in publication, we don't have the data that we need publicly, so we can't get up to 2022 data. But um, you'll see a, a steady rise through kind of 2012, at least for the energy sector, and then it and it comes down, um, and everything really has just been steadily rising. Um, we did know a little bit of a lag, a, kind of a peak at 2018 and 2019. It'll be interesting to see where 2020 comes out. We were even discussing if COVID was a factor there. So you can go to the next slide here. So now we're gonna to transition to strictly uh, focusing on US patent analytics. Next slide. A look at here, same subclass breakdown. You can see energy was really, really strong the last 20 years and then it really again came back. So it's almost as if the patent industry is ahead of uh, the actual, you know, public industry to see where things are at on the storage side of things. Um, but again, transportation and production uh, right up there. And then we have the others kind of lagging behind on as far as patent filings. Next. Within the CPC um, classification system, what we were looking at previously was the subclass, which is just the three letters or fourth letter, I guess. Um, that really narrows in. And what we're looking at here is as specific as the classification system goes. So these are simplified, but I want to just kind of show the as, as narrow as it went um, on the classification side where the patenting was taking place. So you can again see energy storage using batteries is the top, which makes sense. And then we have a manufacturing category, uh, then a transportation energy storage systems for electrical mobility, and then hydrogen technology fuel cells on the energy side. And then um, information technology, energy efficient computing, and uh, also reducing energy consumption in wireless communication networks, uh, improving internal combustion engine efficiencies. So I won't go through every single one of these, but it was interesting to see at the end there, we do have some wind, ener wind, wind energy and uh, solar energy um, kind of midway through the page there. Um, it's a lot, just a lot of fun activity on, on the energy side of things there. Next. So here we're gonna bring back the concept landscape just for a easy um, viewing of the concepts that are being used within the patent filings in the last five years here. Uh, you'll see the electric vehicle. Um, and then again, we're going back to some charging with the uh, surface there. I believe that's referring to solar power. Um, and then, Piers, again, I think you were going to speak to the control. Yes, um, which Ben had, had spoken of, um, Internet of Things, if you will. And that, that question of whether we can transform existing infrastructure into something smarter um, just by putting sensors on everything if you will or whether wholesale new infrastructure is is needed and and um, 
some of the patterns we looked at in the control section, bottom left in orange, um, get, get at some of that. And, and I know that's in, in some areas that that's sort of known as Internet of Things. So, um, but as you say, um, Rob, strong appearance and power, mm -hmm. um, you know, cell technology, batteries, electric vehicles, solar, um, and, and battery mountings and, and, you know, rechargeable stations, stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, thanks, mm -hmm. Rob. Yeah. Next slide. Um, and here we're going to look at the top applicants within the United States. Um, you'll see that blue little starish. Um, that, that is representative applicants that were not in the worldwide filing top designees and are now showing up in the on the U.S. side. And again, we have the red red lines, green lines, people that are kind of moved off. Um, and are adding. Uh, you'll see similar um, Amperex joined again in Huawei, um, and then uh, Rolls Royce is a new addition on the U.S. side of things, and we will actually see them quite a bit here. Um, but yeah, really interesting to see that this, the top filers are remaining the same, but um, you actually seen some new activity on the U.S. side. Next. Here is, uh, again, uh, filing trends within the last 20, 18, 20-ish years. Um, I'm showing on the red dotted line, that is obviously a different scale of things, but it's this, the movement of all U.S. filings. So we see a heavy dip. Again, that's a lot related to the lag in publication. Um, and you'll see that the energy sector there is directly reflective of uh, all U.S. filings. Um, but uh, in the U.S. side, you'll see it was really a heavy rise until about 2011, and things have really flattened out. Um, but just interesting to see the, um, towards 2017, 2018, 2019, you will see kind of each of the lower level are trending downwards. So it'll be interesting. Um, see how that trends. Next slide, please. So we thought we'd look specifically into the transportation sector of clean tech. Um, we're going to take a few, just a few slides here and review the YO2T um, classification. So next slide, please. Look at the worldwide geographic breakdown. Similar to um, YO2 in general, um, but China has less of a, a less of a lead, I'd say. Um, U.S. coming in second. And then really Japan, PCT and German EP founds are all pretty similar. Um, yeah, next slide. Look at the top SMEs worldwide within YO2T. Um, you'll see Nissan and Renault fall off. I did, I did take a look into that. They were the next two listed on the outside of, I think this is the top 20 again. Um, so it's not like they're completely disappearing, but it is interesting to see Nissan, their patent filings are obviously shifting or smaller scale. Um, but we see uh, a few new names on this one, and including um, Safran aircraft engines. Rolls-Royce, again, is quite a ways up on the transportation sector. Um, Porsche and a few uh, foreign companies as well. So interesting. Can go to the next slide. And again, another uh, concept landscape to just look at where the technologies are going in the last five years. Um, it's going to be very, very similar, but we see, do see some new terms in here. The electric pile is referring to a charging station, and then uh, the plate as well is refer is, is what we linked into it. It's it's char it's a charging port type thing. Um, but yeah, this is kind of what you'd expect to see, but it is still a cool way to see it. Next slide. So we took um, a look into the uh, SOSV Climate Tech 100, top 100 startups that Ben had mentioned, and I, I had researched each of their por portfolios, and we've generated some slides on that that are pretty interesting, just to take a look into the actual startups rather than these huge companies to see kind of how patenting trends 
going on that side of things. So you can go to the next slide here. This is a lot of uh, a lot going on here again, but it's less interesting to see the actual names, I'd say, um, and more. You can see that smaller chart there. That is referencing the number of companies within each category that have patents at all. So you can see within building, um, three of the six companies have patents, energy, two of the seven, food, 21 of the 50, um, manufacturing, 12 of 28, and transport, five of nine. Overall, I believe it was 43 of 100 of the top startups have patent activity. Um, so it's just, I uh, thought this was a cool way to see you know, the differences within startup um, kind of mindsets. Also along the bottom there, the year that you see is the uh, founded year. We'll have some more data on that coming up, but you'll see some of the, um, the older founded companies are really the companies with IP and that makes sense. Um, so we can go to the next slide here. What, what struck me, uh, Rob, about that one was the heavy participation among the startups in agriculture and food, you know, 21 out of 50. And, and Ben alluded to that earlier. And I think many folks in this uh, uh, area are thinking that's, that's a strong lever for climate change mitigation. So it's uh, quite heartening to see this. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is interesting to see that side of things. I mean, like I said, it's so dominated by the big players on the top end that you don't really see the movement of food. Um, so it's fun to see kind of on the smaller scale yep. any activity. Next slide. Uh, similar to what we just saw, um, the smaller, smaller chart here is showing how many patents are within each category total. Um, so you'll see again, it's heavily favored towards food and manufacturing. And then the line chart that we're looking at is kind of how things are going year to year. Um, transport, you'll see, is just very flat. It was the, kind of the oldest of all the companies and longest running, but not a whole lot of patenting. And then um, manufacturing is steadily rose to the top. And food has come on as of late 2015 through 2021 and strong. So that um, is obviously one of the newer and most popular patenting areas. Next slide, please. We've taken um, the, the data provided in uh, the spreadsheet that you saw on Ben's side of things and compared it to um, the big chart is the amount of funding compared to patent portfolios. And I thought this was a really interesting side to see. It's not exact, but the correlation of funding to actual IP is obvious here. And again, it's probably weighted towards the older companies that um, are founded a little bit earlier, but you'll see after really the get around spike, um, there really isn't any patent activity for the companies with the, um, the lower amount of funding. And then it's kind of hard to see, I guess, on this um, chart, but the second smaller correlation chart there is the year it was founded again, compared to patent, patent IP size. And it's clear that it's gonna move smaller as you get newer. Um, but it, it was interesting to see that the older companies are about, I think the average there was 60. Um, and then um, what I found was for companies with no IP, the average company founded date was 2018. And that makes sense, some sense because again, of the publication leg, um, anybody with a small number of filings within around 2020 may not be known yet. So, Rob, uh, this slide, a quick question has just come in about VC uh, funding and, and whether IP evaluation is done. And, and we can answer the question more fully at the, at the end of the webinar. But to me, it was just pretty germane that it, it, if, if, if you're viewing it, they believe there is a correlation uh, as you as you sort of listen to us out there that oh heck this looks interesting is there a, 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 is the portfolio size is there a correlation to funding i feel there is of of to some degree or other 
Um, so yes, I, VCs definitely look at, at uh, IP portfolios. Um, we'll get to the question of when uh, a little later, but, but this is an interesting data point, if you will, um, in, in looking at the whole story. So. Yeah, yeah, Piers, I, I, I think there's some, uh, you know, it might be good maybe do a little bit of a deeper dive onto this, um, you know, uh, at this point. Um, you know, I, I, I think our experience is, you know, the, the part, first part of the question is, you know, when, um, you know, when do VC, VC firms uh, do this and who do they, how do they do it and that type of thing. Um, I, I, I think it really depends on the VC firm. I mean, some 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 venture capitalists pay, place a, a, you know, on their ranking criteria or evaluation criteria may place uh, IP, you know, higher up the list than, than others. Um, but, you know, certainly when we are working with clients to do pitch decks, uh, uh, you know, they'll often ask us, hey, you know, we, 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 we'll, we're doing one slide or two slides on our IP. Um, you know, certainly the, those, those um, some venture capitalists certainly do put a high value on that. Uh, I think hopefully, you know, everyone's kind of watched Shark Tank and you'll often, you'll often see there where they're asking an investment and the, the, the investors are, are considering barriers to entry. And where it is something that is, uh, you know, you know, replicable or, or could be, uh, you know, implemented by a competitor uh, without other barriers to entry. They do ask about uh, about the IP. Um, uh, so, you know, we, we do see um, it being, this question being asked by venture capitalists fairly early. Um, and, and as with Shark Tank, they've actually, Shark Tank's got a whole group of attorneys uh, who they kind of use to evaluate the IP for, you know, con uh, for, for companies that go onto that. Uh, similarly, VC firms would work with. Uh, uh, I'm not aware of any of in-house IP counsel. There may be some, but certainly most of them would have an outside firm that they work with, um, you know, for that uh, e evaluation. And again, some will do a deep dive and and really, uh, you know, kick the tires on the IP. Uh, others are, you know, have you thought about IP and 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 what assets do you have in place? Um, and uh, they'll they'll wear that. Um, Piers, I don't know, do you have anything? Uh, the, no, nothing for the, the but, but it's interesting, the question, if we, in the question change, do VC firms have in-house patent counsel to perform evaluations mm. to do corporations? Yes, if everyone will know corporations um, do have uh, generally, or some of the larger ones, in-house patent counsel. And I've worked on both sides of the fence, currently in private practice previously, um, but spent some time in-house. And I know, when we sort of operated in stealth mode, if you will, with the with the corporate strategic department looking at potential acquisitions, we'd kind of, well, not kind of, we would definitely kick the tires and look at the portfolio of the acquisition. But I do recall that I think in every single instance where we thought, okay, this looks like a target we might want to go after. We definitely involved outside counsel for a more thorough review. Um, but Andre, I think you're right. I think VC firms don't generally have in-house. It's they 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 go to external counsel. Yeah. Okay, um, Rob will we'll get back, back to you then. Yep. Back to Rob. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Oh, appreciate that. Uh, next slide. This is the last slide that we have on the patent side, but really took a look at uh, Ben's watch list. And um, this does a good job, actually, of showing the differences in IP strategy for startups. Um, you'll see what we're looking at here is um, a benchmarking IP um, filing list based on each company's year one, year two, through through year fourteen here, of course. Um, but you just see like seventy five F. They actually had, I believe, two patents before the company even started, and then that was all I could find on them. Um, Twice is filing early; um, they're four years in and have IP already. And then you'll see the some of the heavier filers actually waited four, five, six years to start filing and are ramping it up. Um, but yeah, any appears if you have any commentary on that, feel free. Thanks, Rob. Um, this one also goes to the question earlier about the timing. I mean, you can see the green company or Solidio waited a few years, perhaps developing a product and then banged in a lot of patents. These are actually patent apps, not patent issued. So I thought maybe the dwell time was explained by getting a patent through to grant, but it's not, it's actually the apps. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that perhaps some of the com com companies had low filings initially, to me, that doesn't mean, if you will, 
less or meaningless or protection, you can get some really strong patent applications, sort of almost omnibus apps, if you will, from which are spawned a great number of continuations and so forth. So just interesting to see the different approaches taken by um, different companies. Andre, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this one. Yeah, well, I, I do think that might also be explained by, um, you know, during the early years of a company, um, you know, money, money is typically a scarce resource. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, you know, very often companies are constrained in, in their, uh, you know, patent uh, procurement activities uh, in, during, during those years. But I, I think the strategy that Piers pointed out there is, is one we have followed for a number of clients where we, we, we put a, a, a big foundation or a solid foundation in for a, a later portfolio growth and development early on at low cost and also defer expenditure down the road by filing, as Piers mentioned, kind of an omnibus provisional patent application, for example, or uh, you know, or even just an omnibus regular application, and um, you know, and that that could basically keeps the um, patent budget burn rate down for a few years until uh, there's there's uh, better funding, and then we can you know build on that foundation to to uh, you know crush out the portfolio. Uh, so just yeah, one observation there. Thanks. Back to you, Rob. Sure, I think that, that completes my slides. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So at this point, it occurs to me, we've had a little look at Toyota and we've had a little look at Ford and some of the other Chinese, Japanese, uh, US companies, but perhaps we haven't, there's one company we might like to hear about, but more is Tesla. And Andre, I think there is a slide on that in here. So if you have time, Andre, we'll leave a bit of, say five minutes for questions, but it'd be yeah. great if you could review this section for us. Yeah, no, no, thanks, Piers. Yeah, you know, I think when we look at at uh, climate tech, um, you know, th there's a lot of debate around here. Is you know, is a is a strong patent system, or do you want to file patents, or you know, is is it uh, beneficial for uh, you know promoting uh, climate tech to to have a lot of patents, or basically get rid of patents? And there's there's obviously there's you know a larger philosophical debate uh, about that, and um, you know that's been kind of you know r raging. Uh, um, you know, in, in, in the industry as well, uh, from some parties saying, hey, to, uh, you know, promote uh, climate tech, we should really have a weak patent system and people shouldn't be filing patents to the other side saying, no, you know, uh, patent, the patent system provides a lot of incentive for uh, development and, and investment. We need a strong patent system and we even want to put measures in place for patent offices worldwide to accelerate the examination and, and granting of, of, of patents. Um, but one thing I, did, I just wanted to focus on a, a few initiatives here where we are seeing patents being used for good or, or really, uh, you know, um, companies trying to file patents, but, uh, you know, make sure that those are uh, not hindering innovation, um, uh, but also, you know, providing them with some degree of protection. Uh, you know, so I think this, this broad, this broad uh, title, you know, using patents for good is, is is what we're looking at with these patent pledges or uh, IP or patent commons and, and also marketplaces. So we're just going to briefly look at all of those. What, one thing um, we're seeing a lot of companies doing is, is these patent pledges where the company will pledge not to assert or, you know, pledge a royalty-free license or, uh, you know, various types of licenses. Um, Within within certain you know guardrails or, or with certain constraints um, you know applied, um, and the, these motivation for these you know patent pledges. I've got there's a chart over here you know setting out you know altruistic managerial perception and technology reasons why companies may want to to make these pledges, um, and there's a, there's actually a, a database of, of patent pledges we can go look up and and see which companies are pledging which patents and what are the constraints um, on, on those. Um, I, I just kind of highlighted with arrows some of the, uh, you know, motives that I think are perhaps most interesting and applicable for, uh, you know, climate, uh, climate tech. And um, anyway, so uh, you, I'm, I'm not going to read those to you, but uh, you, can, you can take a, a second to, to look at those on, on the slide. Um, when we when you come to patent pledges, probably the most uh, well known is the 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 the, the pledge that Tesla made. Uh, so, I'm sure we can get to the next slide. Uh, so, June 2014, you know, Elon Musk, as, as he does, issues a 
uh, you know, I'm not quite sure if you sent it out by Twitter, but just uh, said, you know, all our patents belong to you, a very eye-catching headline. Um, and, uh, you know, basically saying that, it, it is very interesting, the, 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 the blog, uh, it is actually on, there was a blog post on, on Tesla's website, and he kind of points out that initially Tesla was following a, you know, a very aggressive uh, patent program, um, you know, and uh, they felt compelled to do that because there was concern the big car companies would kind of copy their technology and then use their massive, you know, manufacturing uh, sales and marketing power to just overwhelm Tesla. Uh, interestingly, then he goes to say, we couldn't have been, you know, more wrong. The, the, the reality was the opposite and uh, basically saying that electric car programs at all the big auto manufacturers were small to non-existent, um, you know, 1% of their vehicle sales. And uh, they would have thought, well, wh why are we, you know, these guys aren't, so basically, I think you know Tesla was going out ahead of the, the crowd, and it was this we were, we were patenting, and no one's following us, and we want them to follow us. So uh, you know they made this they made this pledge, um, yeah, which which uh, you know all sounded good. Uh, you know, interesting thing to note here is that you know, the, the the Tesla patent pledges that they will not initiate patent lawsuits against anyone. Important words here: in good faith, wants to use its technology. Uh, they then go on to define a, a breach of good faith as anyone who asserts a patent against Tesla, but even more interestingly is against uh, um, a third party for its use of technologies related to electric vehicles and related equipment. So really what we're seeing there is Tesla using their patent portfolio to discourage uh, others from suing, uh, uh, you know, third, you know, third parties uh, for you know, infringing technologies related to electric vehicles. Uh, so really almost uh, uh, saying that, well, if you, if you are going to use your patent portfolio against other people, uh, you know, this uh, our patent pledge is, doesn't apply to you any longer. Um, also, you know, they, the, the breach of good faith is challenged. So basically you challenge a Tesla patent, uh, you are the pledge no longer applies. And also if you market or sell a knockoff product of any Tesla product, uh, likewise, you're, you're, you're no longer in good faith. Uh, so as I say, the, I think the headline sounded very good, but if you kind of read the small print, it is, it does, you know, retain uh, some obviously uh, uh, an easy way for Tesla to, to, to you know, allege uh, breach of, of good faith. Uh, but, you know, an interesting thing there is really them really, uh, you know, using their patent portfolio uh, to somewhat discourage others, you know, from discouraging patent litigation in the, uh, in the electric vehicle area. Um, yeah, it, it, it is interesting to see in light of, of this pledge, uh, you know, what Tesla did with their patent program. If you can go to the next slide, uh, you, you can see there that this is their, their patent filings by date. Um, so even after 2014, there was a dip, I think. And, and in their press release, they actually said, oh, we've taken down our patent wall. Um, so in 2014, there you know, was a dip, but then you just see it kind of ramping up again. And, uh, you know, they've been consistently, you know, filing, um, filing patents, uh, you know, since then. Uh, the, the dips in 20 and 2021 are just because of the, you know, the delayed publication. Uh, there's, a, there's a publication delay. So probably the last good stat we have there is 2019. Um, but anyway, just, uh, just interesting to see that story. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So I just wanted to look at a brief look at another uh, three three initiatives that we have seen uh, industry take trying to uh, use patents uh, to uh, you know promote in innovation and collaboration. Uh, you know patent pools are, are a common way to do this but uh, they've actually actually kind of three initiatives and interestingly enough the first two uh, failed. Um, um, so we can yeah, quickly go to the next uh, the next slide. Uh, with this green uh, green exchange, this was uh, launched in January 2010 uh, by Nike, um, the Creative Commons and uh, and Best Buy, and it really sought to provide a, a standard patent license structure for uh, you know patents that these companies owned uh, and that other companies could join uh, that were related to kind of clean or climate tech. Uh, but basically, it just didn't uh, it didn't gather traction and uh, part of that was just because uh, in retrospect they were saying the, the, the license structure wasn't that attractive. Um, Nike did say that they did however gain significant insights uh, from this collaboration to continue to inform 
their strategy about bringing sustainability innovations to scale. Uh, so, um, yeah, the next initiative, um, we can go to the next slide, uh, was this uh, EcoPC or uh, Eco Patent uh, Commons, uh, initiated in, in uh, 2008, which spearheaded by IBM and actually Dave Kapos when he was at IBM before he became, before he joined the patent office and uh, ultimately joined by 12 other companies. Idea here really this patent pool of, of green related technologies and when you when you contributed a patent to this to this pool, basically what you're doing is uh, you know providing an irrevocable covenant not to assert the patent against any third party who who was uh, using that uh, for you know providing environmental benefit. Again, this this never really caught traction and began to wind down in uh, 2011 and, and and ceased operations in in uh, 2016. And there are also various you know uh, thoughts on why that. Uh, why that failed, but uh, if we go to the next um, the next slide, yeah, and that basically shows you know the number the, these are the companies that participated in the Eco uh, Patent Commons and the number of patents that they pledged uh, for that. So you can see it's also not a uh, not 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 a substantive number of patents, um, and uh, you know I think that might have been a one of the contributing factors to its demise. Uh, next slide. Yeah, the, the, fi the final one is this WIPO Green, which is really a marketplace for sustainable technologies. Uh, not a pooling arrangement, rather just kind of a marketplace that seeks to connect patent owners and, and green technology purchases. Uh, it's not kind of a naked uh, patent licensing. It's really, you know, you license the technology and the patents. And you'll see there that this, this, uh, this initiative really seems to be getting uh, a lot more traction than, than the others. Um, and you know you can you can go there if you're you know if you're a green technology company and you're looking to to license some technology and see what see what technologies are being offered. Uh, next slide. Uh, so that's just a screenshot of the database, and uh, you know I'd encourage you to uh, you know if, if you're interested, go have a look. It's a very easy database to search, and those are the, the various uh, you know, climate tech uh, verticals uh, where you can kind of search and try you know and find technologies that uh, you. If you're interested, you may want to uh, to license. Okay, and that's uh, that's it from me. Uh, I think we're now just uh, opening up for any uh, questions or, or comments that anyone um, may have. Yeah, thanks, Andre. And it's interesting to me, one of the factors and the pledges was um, perception. Um, and as Rob and I were looking at the classifications, the one that really only talks about um, climate mitigation, if you will, or that word, um, uh, is the YO2. I mean, there are many other classes that, that we looked at that, that are germane to clean tech, but um, it seems if you want to <laughs> add to the luster of your company, try, try and use the YO2 uh, classification because that it shows you, you may be directing efforts in that area. We did have one question come in. I think we got a couple of minutes to answer it. Um, the question was, did we uncover any discernible trend in organic filing versus acquiring patents. Um, and Rob, I know when we looked at the, um, the, the the startups you looked at were mainly organic. Would, would you say that's true? Yeah, definitely. Okay. We definitely we, the, the, the startups that we looked into was mostly organic filings. Okay. I know it can depend, obviously, because from what I've seen, um, companies sometimes get a massive interest in patents and acquire very quickly when they get sued. Um, but uh, Andre, any counter thoughts on what you've seen over the years in trends, acquisition versus organic? Yeah, I, mean, I you know, I think a lot of the the stats that we you know we looked at there were for the startups in particular were um, you know they, they the startups are, are probably typically less likely to to acquire, um, but I think certainly some of the you know the, some of the incumbents um, where they're kind of playing catch up. Uh, you know, may may then go and look and uh, you know do do more acquisitions. Uh, so I think if you looked at the the big companies, uh, you, you you might see more um, uh, you know evidence of of of, of acquisition of, of IP there. Um, but I, I don't think we did a, a specific uh, review of that to kind of analyze whether the, you know for the for the large guys or, or even the small guys whether uh, their their portfolios were organically grown or. Uh, were, were acquired uh, from from elsewhere. Okay. Uh, yeah. One last question, very quickly. I think about a minute. How will the rise of China as a very large patent filer 
influence the ability of US companies to sell into China. Two quick observations on that. I know when I operated there, um, there was a big push by the, the Chinese authorities, if you will, to show they were upholding the rights of patent holders. And for a while there, the Viagra patent was upheld when everywhere else had been invalidated. Um, I also, Rob and I were looking at the Chinese filings and thought, oh, a bunch of these, I think Rob, you said 600,000 or 60,000 were uh, utility models. And you think, oh, well, you know, uh, Matt, does that diminish uh, the stature of some of those filings? To me, not really, because some of the largest or most difficult thorns in my side when I operated there were utility models. So I think it's a great question, whether they're valid or not. It's a, a, an interesting question. There's been recent uh, uh, investigations into this, uh, even formalistic validity, let alone um, um, prior art validity. So uh, folks, if anyone has any further questions, feel free to contact us uh, you know, outside of, of, of the webinar or submit them to Michelle and we can get an answer to you. But Michelle, I think that brings us to the end. And with that, I'll say thanks to everyone and hand it back to Michelle just to close us out. Thank you, Piers. Thank you for joining us, everyone. And thank you to our speakers. We invite you to come back and join us for future SLW Institute webinars. Coming up February 8th through March 18th is our 2022 virtual PCT training seminar with Carl Opedal. And this seminar is free for attendees. And you can find more information on the SLW Institute on the Schwegman, Lundberg, and Wissner website. Thank you again for joining us and be well.